I thought my father was a successful businessman, but it turns out that he was a British MI6 secret agent. And on top of that, if you think that's amazing, it turns out I was adopted and my real father was the world's most notorious drug lord. Holy <laughs> Hello, hello, sir. Hi, yeah. Uh, I appreciate your time, and I apologize as well if I'm talking a little odd. I got my wisdom teeth taken out on Monday. Happy days. <laughs> I'm sure right now, uh, a few of the audience that are watching are wondering, how the hell does Pablo Escobar's son have this thick English accent? <laughs> the whole thing starts for me in 1959. In 1959, this real-life James Bond character, his name is Patrick Whitcomb. And he gets sent down to Colombia on a secret mission to help the Colombian government organize their financial resources and track all the, all the loose cash that's running around in gangs and stuff. This is long before the cartels and long before the drug trafficking business got big. But it's an undercover mission. So they set up a banknote printing operation for the Colombian government. And they have an armored car division which transports the money around Colombia. So this is the legitimate side of the whole company and so on and so forth. But underneath this, the managing director of the company in Colombia is Patrick Whitcomb, who's also a British Secret Service agent operating undercover by orders from the British government. It's just amazing stuff. Wow. <laughs> guy, you, you, yeah, we haven't even started. So then what happens next, right, is that the armored cars are working and this gang decide to rob an armored car. The gang hides this money in a house in a village. The intelligence gets out that the money's there, so they launch a special mission to retrieve the money and it all kicks off. You know, it's a proper gunfight. A couple of hoodlums run away, they get away, the rest are all shot. And the two guys that got away, one of them was um, a young Pablo Escobar Gavira, but, you know, no, nobody knew who this guy was. He's just a, a kid in a gang. Eventually, they get the money back, and then Dad goes into the back room, and there's a young girl, and she's 14, and she's dying. She's got a bullet in her back. It's just an accident. That's what happens in these things, you know? And as she's dying, she hands the MI6 agent a document, and he holds her hand while she dies, and she asks him to look after her baby boy who's in a cot, and his name is Roberto. And... Um, so it's very sad, I, I don't like talking about it. And so I'm Roberto, Roberto Sendoy Escobar. I still have nightmares about that little girl I witnessed in that cot. I was in a cot and I saw this little girl dying. I didn't know what it was, I just still have these flashbacks. At what point did you go from the orphanage into your dad's? Oh, very quick. It was like a few months, nothing. It, it wasn't just feeling sorry for me. I mean, he did his bit by looking after me just to take me to the orphanage. That would have been enough because he saved my life, took me to an orphanage, done his job. But there's a lot more complications, there's political implications and all sorts of going on because when they set the company up, there's another Escobar involved, an older relative. So when they find out that this boy happens to be a relative of this guy, they decide that that's useful and will be useful later. And so they use me as a pawn in the whole big game, you know. Oh wow, there's so many levels of the political game. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a multifaceted thing, it's not simple. They realized this was an opportunity to create a situation which would help them in the future. So my paperwork come through, then I have this life in Colombia, which is extremely dangerous and violent life. And my real father discovers who I am. He's getting quite powerful and he sends people to try and bring me back. I remember seeing, you know, my bodyguard shooting some guy in the head right in front of me. And it's just, ugh. you never forget that stuff. So you, did you have a bodyguard with you at all times? All times, yeah. When I was at school in Colombia, they didn't, I didn't go to school on the bus. I got sent to school in an armored truck with two bodyguards armed to the teeth. For a short time, they're able to control these situations. And I go to Medellin once a year to meet the man from Medellin, who I don't know who he is. Dad, my adopted father, to infiltrate the businesses that he was trying to get gain the trust, he used to do some of their cash carrying for them. And this was just a part of infiltrating the very young Medellin cartel operators. We also used to go to Medellin once a year to where the dons used to meet. Colombia is run by dons. So you get these local landlords like the, and they call them the dons. And they used to have these gatherings. And in the early days, Pablo Escobar and his hoodlums used to do some bodyguarding and stuff. 
at these things. And uh, they had their own table. And I used to go to this table with my bodyguards and I used to have to sit next to this guy. I didn't know who he was. You know, they just told me that's what I had to do. My dad and his people were over there at that table and I'd be with my two bodyguards and, and I'd have to go and sit with this guy and, you know, he'd kind of go, yeah. Is he aware that you're his son? Yes. On one of the occasions, he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, ah, mi hijo. And I thought, okay. And he told me never to forget that I was an Escobar. I didn't think anything of it. But when I went back, spoke to dad, I said, why did he say I was his hijo? And dad just went, oh yeah, you know, these guys or something like that, shrugged it off. But I've never, ever forgotten that. Your dad allowed you to meet with your biological father who was growing up to come become this ruthless leader. Yeah. And what was the reason just to continue building, maintaining that relationship? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But also to say, this is what we have and you can't have it. It's this kind of relationship. Do as you're told and we'll let you see him. That's really scary when you think about it. The political intricacies of this are so fascinating yet also complicated because I think at first glance at the store, people are assuming the MI6 agent would be there to oppose the Medellin cartel and all these dons, yet there's, 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 there's collaboration. Yes, and that is a kind of scandal in a way. But you've got to remember, how does the British Empire work? They get into these countries that are not properly organized, and they, they organize it for them and build it up, and then they get all the contracts. Hey, home, that's part of the British Empire. It's very naive, in my mind, the way I sometimes see things as being very black and white, like, okay, Pablo Escobar, bad guy, MI6 agents, good guy, coming in. Yeah, I, I mean, who is doing the kidnapping? The politics is, is frightening. From a young age, you are where you're adopted, but you don't know who your biological father is until 1984. Is that correct? No, 89. So my adopted father, the MI6 agent, he's not living in Colombia. I'm living on the Costa del Sol with my wife, my kids, two dogs, a cat. You know, I'm just having an ordinary life. And then dad rings me up and he's now he's running the same operation, but he's got a different cover story and he's in Madrid. Oh, up until then, you know, he works in security, but you don't know at all. He's an MI6 agent. No, 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 no. He's head of an armored car truck business. So at what point does your father tell you he's an MI6 agent? And then secondly, that you are the son of Pablo Escobar. Yeah, so it, it starts in 89 and he gives me a document. And it's literally a notarized document from a uh, registry in Colombia. And it says who I am, right? It says mother, father, in father, Pablo Escobar, yada, 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 yada. And I'm thinking, yeah, so what? You gotta remember that in 1989, I'm living on the Costa del Sol. We don't have internet, we don't have Google, we don't have anything. So I don't even know who Pablo Escobar is even when he tells me who Pablo Escobar is. It took me quite a while, like a year or two, to research him and, and work out what the hell is going on. I left Spain in uh, May 1990 and we went back to England because my wife had a brain tumor and she was dying so we had to get her back. And the strange twists of fate that happened, both of my fathers died in 1993, it's pretty weird. Your wife has tragically died of a brain tumor, both your fathers have died, and at the same time you're probably still also processing this knowledge that your biological father was this ruthless drug kingpin. How did that affect you mentally? So, you, you, I, I don't know how it affects other people, but I just started drinking. Which, of course, is the worst thing you can do, really. But I just took to drink and got depressed and more and more depressed and got ill. 1994, I went downhill big time and I ended up on a mental health unit. I tried to commit suicide, I was very depressed. You know, really bad. So, it's, uh, I laugh and joke about my life and that's my way of coping. But the truth of the matter is that, you know, I've had a very sad, childhood and some very traumatic things happened to me. I remember going for a liver scan and they said, you carry on like this, you'll have two years left. And I looked at the kids and said, right, I've got these two kids, I need to live for them. So I, I went straight to the bar afterwards and ordered a Diet Coke. And that was the hardest thing I've done in a long time because, uh, you know, when you're addicted to alcohol and you have depression, it's almost impossible to get out of that stuff. But hey ho, I got help and one of the ways I did it was to write all my problems down on paper. Eventually these piles of paper really helped me because they're notes that I, of my memories and stuff. And, I, and it helped me when I decided to finally get on the typewriter. 
this is a strange question to ask because obviously you hold no responsibility for the actions of your biological father. But how do you process knowing the the, the, the horrible things well, that your biological I'm, father did? I'm angry about it. I'm angry about it. All of us, we're victims of these people. If you've experienced a crime that's been perpetrated against you by someone who's addicted to drugs, then you have been a victim of Pablo Escobar in some way or another because these guys started this thing and so uh, I signed a contract in the UK with a big charity called Homestar and this charity literally pumped money into families who have a need quite a large percentage of my royalties from this book worldwide go straight to this charity. I just wish that everyone with a lot of money to spare would do this. Uh, it would be one of my wishes if I could make it happen. I'll do my bit. If this book is a worldwide bestseller, just think of the hundreds of thousands of dollars that can go into helping kids all around the world. And I don't even have to deal with it. I've set it up so my lawyers get the money and pay it out to the charities. So I'm not tempted to keep it and buy a yacht. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for your time, sir. I really do appreciate it. You've been so wonderfully easy to talk to. It's been a real fun time. Thank you very much.